I think I was in the middle of a murder trial. I was always in the middle of a murder trial. I was doing murder and discrimination at the same time. <coughs> and um, a woman came to me who had a case against Merrill Lynch. And she described that when she was initially a, a young broker, Merrill Lynch would, was all male. And you would, uh, there would be parties when uh, a broker was, it was his birthday, and the parties would have cakes in the shape of penises, or there would be a stripper who would come out of the cake. She was a tough lady, and she would say, all right, I'm going to take this. She shouldn't have to take it, but I'm going to take it as long as it didn't matter to my ultimate, the money I was making. Uh -huh. If it didn't matter in terms of money, I will take it. And she took it, and she took it. And then she began to realize that, in fact, that to some degree, the same attitudes that privileged that put their finger on the scale in terms of her money. Uh, she, you know, private, th there would be uh, parties at the, you know, the Bruins or the Celtics. She wouldn't be invited. Male brokers could invite their, their um, uh, th you know, their clients. Mm -hmm. There would be, uh, you know, offerings that were offered to the men but not to the women. When brokers left their their book, it was called, their accounts would be distributed, and she would not get as much as any. And all of a sudden, she realized it really was affecting the bottom line, and so she sued. Um, it was not an easy case because it was a case about lost opportunities. You can't translate that so easy, easily into dollars. So we told a narrative. It was a narrative that I was familiar with. We told the judge a, a story about starting with penis cakes and strippers and ending up with this uh, difference in her pay and that she felt compelled to leave when she realized that, uh, that this, these differences had been going on. And she left and the judge didn't award us damages but awarded a quarter of a million in, in uh, punitive damages. And as I write in the book, I mean, I, I, uh, that, that continues to happen, particularly in professions in which um, which are sort of like cowboy professions, where there is not a, a unified structure where essentially you make what you kill, and that's brokerage. Even doctors are like that, and we see sexual harassment in those situations as well. Yes, we do. And it's, it's wonderful that you expose in your book the link between harassment and discrimination. I mean, the ultimate goal is discrimination. They just use the harassment to discriminate. It's something that has not been addressed by, by society at all. Well, it, 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 when you think about it, it's only maybe a generation and a half ago when women were formally excluded from professions and jobs, formally excluded. So now you, you, the, the enterprise is to try to figure out the ways in which those obstacles remain. Mm -hmm. You don't change something by suddenly taking the signs down off the door. It takes education. It takes uh, affirmative changes. And sexual harassment was a classic example of that. The signs were down on the door. But if you're going to keep on demeaning me, I'm, no, I'm not going to feel welcome here. I'm not going to feel comfortable here, and I'm not going to stay. And sexual, when, when the courts began to realize that sexual harassment was a form of discrimination against women and provided an impediment for women's progress, that's when the law began to, began to change. This excerpt is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law, the leader of reform in legal education and the leader in multimedia education for the public. To view the full interview and for a full listing of MSL's programs, log on to mslaw.edu.